Hey, hey, ambitious women and entrepreneurs, you're listening to the Ambition Coffee and Lip Gloss Podcast with your host, Marcelle Coleman, licensed therapist, intuitive consultant, and chief ambition coach, ready to give you the real strategies, the real truth from real experts. Are you a spiritually conscious, highly ambitious woman ready to take your expertise to the next level? You've put in the time and the grind, and now it's time to make your next power move. Well, this episode is for you. Episode number seven. Well, today I am so excited about my conversation with Lorna L.A. Lewis, and The one reason why I'm excited is because about six years ago, I interviewed LA for a different project. And now we're six years later and I get to catch up with her, see what she's working on. Well, I know what she's working on because I am a fan of hers and I've been following her ever since that first interview. So let me tell you what's going on. Lorna L.A. Lewis is a national best-selling author. Um, L.A. is an educator, and she's also a writing coach. And then when I find out there are so many other wonderful projects that she has been working on, that it just lets you know that you can bring your dream and your ambitions to a reality. But you got to know how to cultivate the habits of a successful writer and a published author. So, L.A. came back and we're going to go right into that conversation because I really know that as a writer and as a published author, she is so, so powerful. But more than that, L.A. is a teacher at heart and she has the capacity to help individuals really make their dream a reality. And it's great if you can do the work, but when you can show others and your excitement for others is just as big as your excitement is for yourself, then successful people are always coming out of her work and out of her gifts and what it is that she gives back to the industry. So I hope you join me today as we go into this conversation with L.A. Lewis. Hey, L.A., welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. You are so welcome. Well, I'm so excited to talk to you today because I just love the work that you do. And this is sort of our second time meeting in this style. I think the last time was like 2014, but ever since then, I have become a a big fan and following you on social media and all of that. Thank you. No problem. It's been great. <laughs> I think I snuck in a few of your groups too. So <laughs> well, groups. that's a good thing. <laughs> it is. It, it really is. And such an inspiration to us all. So LA, I really want to start this off with you introducing yourself to the audience and giving us some background on who you are, sort of where you're from and some of your journey in your career path. Okay. So my name is, well, I write under the name L.A. Lewis. So if you're a reader and you've read my novels, then you probably know me as L.A. Lewis. Um, If you're a client, you may know me as Lorna. So I go by both, actually. So either one is fine. I am an AALBC, national bestselling author. I have three novels. I started writing in, oh, 2009, that's when I published my first novel, Dirty Little Secrets. So um, since then, I've written three novels and two novellas, three short stories, a daily devotional, and I also do customized journals, which are journals for men, women, children, but I put their picture on the cover and whatever title they want to use on the cover as well. I love everything literacy, everything literature, books, novels, um, movies, all those are my thing. A few years ago, I started doing what I called a blog, um, a blog series. It was called Secrets from the Bayou. And what I was doing with that blog, I would write a section every week and it was almost like a soap opera, but it came out every Tuesday on my blog. 
and my readers would get a chance to read each installment as they would come out. So a good friend of mine who is in the movie industry approached me and she asked me, how did I feel about turning that blog into a web series? So of course I jumped on that because it sounded like fun. I had no idea how much work (laughs) it was going to be. But since then, we did start filming Secrets from the Bayou, which is uh, we have the first episode on YouTube. And we were in the process of filming the next three episodes before everything took place. So we're on a standstill right now and just trying to, you know, stay focused and be ready whenever we can get started again and get back to work. But I am constantly staying busy because I'm also a writing coach. Uh, One of my clients just released her um, memoir this week, uh, Tuesday, she released her memoir. So I'm always in celebratory mode. If not for myself, for my clients and for fellow authors and people in the movie industry. So it's good. It is good right now. Wow, it sounds good. And as you say, busy. So, um, yes. LA, I wanted to ask you, so from the Dirty Little Secrets, I think that mm-hmm. was the book that might have been released. God, I think it might. What year was the Dirty Little Secrets uh, released? 2009. Okay, so that was already released by the time I knew you had one. One of the books that had already been released because that's how mm-hmm. I connected with you. Was that your very first book or your very first book? It was. Okay. That was my very first. Okay. Can you take us from before that book? Like, what is the mindset of an author like yourself? What types of preparation that you went through or that you already had when you decided, I'm going to take, because uh, a lot of people are writing, but you are a bestseller. Right. So what's the mindset prior to that book, even getting the pen to the paper? Actually, when I wrote Dirty Little Secret, I had no, I don't want to say I didn't have a desire to write. It wasn't something I, I thought about, to be honest with you. When I was in school, my high school and college professors, English professors told me that I should go into journalism. They saw something in me that I did not see in myself at that time. So I went into education. The way I started with Dirty Little Secrets, it was during the summer. I I was teaching second grade, and I noticed there was a gap between second and third grade in terms of skills. So my plan for the summer was to create a workbook that I could use with my students at the end of the year to kind of prepare them more for third grade. So when I started on the English book, I was doing, I was writing short stories. Well, the problem came in, I was enjoying writing these short stories that were supposed to be short. And I didn't want to stop. Like I kept writing. So I finished their workbook and I just, it was just so spur of the moment. I was like, I'm going to try to write a book. Because I enjoy, like I said, I don't know. It was just that feeling of sitting down and creating something new. So Mm -hmm. I started writing I had no title for Dirty Little Secrets. I had two characters. I knew it wanted to be about a school teacher because I was a school teacher at the time. Um, I knew I wanted to be about her, she and her husband, but I knew it had to be something more than just, you know, her being a teacher. There had to be some drama. I don't outline. I still don't outline to this day. Mm-hmm. I allow the story to just unfold as I'm, t- it's almost, and I know it sounds crazy, but it's almost like I'm watching a film. And I'm simply typing the words that I hear on this film. I I try to outline. I just can't. It stifles my creativity. So that's how I just sat down and started writing. Now, the first draft was garbage. I'm going to say that. Mm. It was horrible. (laughs) But that's where a good editor comes in and help you fix it up and make it sound right and make sure there are no plot holes or anything like that. So it was just a matter of getting the story out, though. And the good thing about me then versus me now, I went into it with no expectations. I didn't even know I was going to publish that book. I just wanted to write. I just wanted to finish telling a story. Or really, I just wanted to recreate that feeling that I had when I was writing those short stories. So it was really just for me. You know, I was just writing. 
It wasn't until I started sending it to people that they were like, oh, you need to publish this. This is so good. So that's when I started looking into publishing and self-publishing and things like that. But back then, I had no desire to publish it. So the good thing about that was that I didn't have the, I guess, pressure that I put on myself now. Because now I know when I'm writing, other people are going to read it. Not only that, I feel like I have a reputation of being a great storyteller. And I never want to lose that reputation of being a great storyteller. So it's always trying to outdo the book prior to this one. Wow. So, and that's, that's self-pressure, you know, that's what I do to myself, which isn't always good, but it does push you to do more, to study more, to talk to more authors who are where you desire, where I desire to be. It's just putting in the work and to continue growing and reading. I read a lot. And that's also the mistake I made in writing Dirty Little Secrets. I wasn't reading. I would read like almost a novel a week. I stopped completely because in my mind, I didn't want to accidentally use anything from any other author in my work. That was so wrong. I didn't realize that until later, to years later, actually, that good authors read all the time, especially while they're writing. Because they're reading for a different purpose. It's more so to study the craft versus to really get into the book as a reader. You're really reading as a critic, pretty much. But it's a learning thing. Okay. What's the time frame? How how long did it take for you to get that first book, uh, like, published? I know it was kind of garbage. You call it garbage the first time. Then mm-hmm. you started sending it to people. Just take a look at how long did it take for that book? Do you remember the total time um, for, from you doing the first draft to getting it published? To publish? I started in June because it was during the summer. I want to say it was June. And I published in October. Hmm. So four months. Wow. So now are the summers significant for you because you were a teacher or is just good writing in the summer? At that time, it was because I was a teacher. I was in the school system and that's when I had more free time. I, at that time, you know, my children were small, so they were doing their own thing. They were at summer camps and all of that. So I did still have a lot of free time to just sit and write. Mm. Wow. And so how did Dirty Little Secrets do when you f- published it? Is that the book that you got the bestseller for? No, it was actually my third book. So Dirty wow. Little Secrets, it did well. It did well, but I still had a lot of growing to do as an author. Because again, I was writing just for myself. So I wasn't really thinking about publishing this book. Once I started publishing and really got into it, then I started learning more and started growing more and writing and working with the coach myself to help me grow as a writer, you know, and taking more seminars and we're going to more seminars and webinars and just learning more about the craft of putting together a great story. So by my third story, if anyone was to read Dirty Little Secrets, they would be pleased with the story but they would definitely see an improvement by the time I got to Double Down and Dirty, which is my third novel, which is the novel that I have the national bestseller for. Yeah. Okay. Double Down and Dirty. That's the one I remember. So what happened to that one in the middle though? How did the one, is it just like the middle child syndrome? (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) Pretty much. My third novel, it was Dirty Little Secrets 2, Expect the Unexpected. So a lot of my readers who read the first one did read the second one. And to be honest with you, even when I go places and I sell, you know, if I set up somewhere to sell my books, Dirty Little Secrets and Dirty Little Secrets 2 are always my best sellers when I'm out selling, even today. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with the... Not only the cover, but also the when people see, you know, a school teacher and they hear drama. Now, now people will ask, is she messing with her students? And I have to say, no, she's not. (laughs) It is not that kind of drama. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
So yeah. what put Double Down and Dirty up to the top of the market? What do you think happened? Two things. By the time I wrote Double Down and Dirty, I had already published two books. So I had a, a large audience who were also able to talk, you know, once I did the release, those people who read the first two were now talking about, you know, I can't wait to get my hands on this one and, you know, and sharing it and spreading the news about it. So that helped. And I was with a writing group and we all, whenever we would release a book, we would all promote each other's work. So that helped. So it was the marketing and not only that, but like I said, I had gained more audience, more readers. Yeah. So LA, tell me about how Double Down and Dirty kind of did so well in the market. Okay. So by the time I wrote Double Down and Dirty, I'd already grew my readership, (laughs) my Mm -hmm. viewers, because, you know, I already had two books out that I had been promoting and marketing all those years. Now, the time frame between Dirty Little Secrets and Double Down and Dirty was Wait, let's see. I wrote, I published Dirty Little Secrets in 2009. I didn't publish Double Down and Dirty to 2016. So I've had all that time to really grow my audience. And also by that time, Facebook became really big. So that helped a lot with being able to show my work and promote my work. So it wasn't just me and my readers, but I was also in a writing group. And we all promoted each other's work. So that helped as well. And the marketing, you know, with my other books, it was just me sharing and putting it out there. The new release was coming. Now I have a team sharing and putting out there that the new release is coming. And it did really well. So I really believe all of that is what contributed to Double Down and Dirty making it to the bestsellers list. So can you tell us a little bit about what it means to grow as an author and how that's like one part of it and any other part of is part of growing as an author, being willing to be in a writing group. So what are some of the things that people who want to really do well in the business need to know about growing as an author? I think it's very important, like I said before, to read. You have to be a reader. You have to read, especially books in your genre, especially books that you want to write, the type of books that you want to write. You want to read those books so that you will see what your audience like. I tell my clients also to go to Amazon and read the reviews. Look at what the readers are saying, not only what they like, but what they didn't like. So you won't do those things in your book. Now, also understanding that, you know, everything isn't for everybody. So just because someone said, I don't like that they use this word, that doesn't mean you can't use that word. That just wasn't for them. So take the good, use what you can, and just throw away the rest. Also, surrounding yourself or making sure you have people who will read your work and give you honest opinions about your work. I have two types of people when I'm writing. I have my people who, as I'm writing, I will send them my work and they are like praising it and, oh, I can't wait for the next one. There's nothing wrong with it. If it was up to them, I would just submit it to be published right then. Like it is wonderful. But they're the people that I use to keep me motivated. They're the people who are texting or emailing and saying, where's the rest? Send me the rest. They keep me going. So I have them while I'm writing. But after I finish writing, I have beta readers who are people who I may not be as close to. Now, the people that I use during writing, they're my cousins, they're my friends, people like that. Beta readers are people I'm not as close to in terms of having a relationship with. So they will tell me honestly, you know, I don't like the way this sound. I didn't understand that. You may want to think about changing that. This whole paragraph didn't make sense. You know, they don't really, they're not trying to avoid hurting my feelings. They understand that their role is to make sure that I'm putting out the best work that I can put out. So, and you have to have tough skin because as an author, you know, when I write, I feel like it's wonderful. It sounds great to me. So for someone else to come back and say, I ain't like that at all. You know, you have to be able to accept that and not get offended. You have to be able 
definitely be able to accept criticism because there's no way you're going to grow without someone teaching you and guiding you and pointing out, like my editor pointed out, I used the word just a lot. I hadn't even noticed it. So when she pointed it out, I know now every time I don't even type the word just. Like. LA, you, you're talking to us about some of the things that takes, like you say, thick skin, having uh, people who fall into maybe two categories. How did those people get, are those consistent people in your life? Or you've got a, a set group of people that you always send your manuscripts to? Yeah, for the most part, I do. Okay. Especially when I, during writing with the people who are just the cheerleaders, is like I said, because they're my cousins and friends, Family. those mm-hmm. are the people, right? They're the ones I send the rough draft to just to get some feedback and for them to keep me motivated, keep me going. Mm-hmm. Now, the beta readers sometimes will change because it just depends on who's available because yeah. these are the, you know, they're reading a whole book and critiquing a whole book. So you have to make sure that there are people, that you're using people who can commit to that because you are dependent on them because the beta readers come before the editing. So, you know, you're kind of on a time frame and you need people that you know will, that you can depend on to read this book, give you your critiques back and you go through them and make any changes, clear up anything that wasn't clear because you want it, even though your editor is going to tear it completely apart, you Mm -hmm. still want it to be the very best that you feel like it could be before sending it to the editor. Got it. Okay. After Double Down and Dirty, what came after that? I mean, how do you get over the fact that you have a bestseller What happens with the next book after that? Like, do you have some expectations or do you get what you in it for? (laughs) What does that feel like, number one? I really want to know what it feels like to become a national bestseller. What is the feeling around that, you know, after writing three books? Yeah, it's an amazing feeling. And I didn't even know my editor she put it on Facebook because what happens, um, AALVC publishes a monthly newsletter and in the newsletter, it lists the national bestsellers for the previous month. So she put it on, she posted it on Facebook. I didn't even know. So of course I was like, because I had already made the national bestsellers list from an anthology that we'd written. Um, you really got no sign sealed delivered. I'm yours. Mm. So that was the name of the anthology. And each writer wrote a romance based on a Motown novel. I mean, a, mm. a Motown song. Mine was, you really got a hold on me. So our book, the entire book made it to the national bestseller. So, so I was already a national bestselling author because I contributed to that book, but I hadn't done it on my own. So to have my own book was like, Mm. it was a total, totally different feeling because that was mine, you know, it Mm. felt really good. What comes with that? Like when you did your own, like what opportunities come with that when that happens for you? Is it more external or internal type of uh, feeling? Like, do you really see it? in the industry or do you kind of still see it within your group of your genre of writers? Yeah, more so within our genre. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, it was because I knew I wanted to, I'm a teacher, you know, even though I'm no longer in the school system, I'm still a teacher. So I knew I wanted to teach something that I enjoy, which is writing. Really, it gave me that boost to say that, okay, I, can, I am good enough to do this. I know I'm a great teacher, but I wanted to make sure that as a writer, I could really, I don't know. I don't know if it's just a, a title, but it's something on the inside of me that made me feel like I can do this now. Mm. I can really teach people what I've learned because I have learned so much and still learning so much throughout the year. Wow. How do you measure the change that you experience as a writer when you got a coach, like versus you doing it on your own? What's the significant difference in when you 
went and got a coach uh, versus the writing that you were doing early in the early years? Oh, so different. <laughs> mm. So different because she's the one. Now, my coach was also my editor. So she's a teach, she was a teaching editor. So she was the one who pointed out the words and she was the one who helped me in terms of being more descriptive in my writing. You know, a lot of people tell me when they read Dirty Little Secrets that it's almost like they're watching a movie. But I know for sure they have that feeling when they read Double Down and Dirty because it's so sensory detail. Like when my characters walk into a building, I describe the place, the sounds, the smells. So it's like the reader is able to walk right in with them versus with Dirty Little Secrets. It was more narrative driven. Mm-hmm. So it's more dialogue and mm-hmm. Double Down and Dirty is a good balance of both dialogue and narrative wow make me want to just sign up so let me ask you a question it just sounds so cool coming from you when a person says that they are a fiction versus non-fiction or non-fiction versus fiction what does that mean in the industry is it that some people are playing it safe and others are using a Uh, broader creativity or as a coach and as a a national bestseller, when you hear people say, Oh, I am a nonfiction writer Mm -hmm. um, or they will never touch a fiction uh, book with a pen. What is your thoughts about that? I believe you have to be true to what you like, you know, Mm -hmm. true to your desire as a writer. I write more fiction than nonfiction. Really the only nonfiction book I wrote was daily devotional. Everything else I've written has been fiction. Of course, all fiction is has some nonfiction, non-fiction in it because yeah. we're using real life mm-hmm. scenarios and things like that. But some people just enjoy nonfiction over fiction. Some people enjoy fiction over nonfiction. I enjoy reading fiction novels. So that's my passion. That's where I'm going to really pour my energy into all of my clients have been nonfiction mm. novelists now. They all have written memoirs. Now, I've never written a memoir, but I've read plenty. Mm-hmm. So as a teacher, and I'm also, I, with my clients, I like to do what's called non, um, creative nonfiction writing. So even though they are writing a nonfiction book, it almost reads more like a, a fiction novel especially with memoirs right now, unless you are a this famous person or you've done something so miraculous, most people aren't going to pay attention to memoirs. But if it's engaging, if it's a page turner, they will pay attention to it because look, real life is more interesting than fiction any day. <laughs> so it's just a matter of putting that together. It's a matter of how you put it together and how you tell the story. So if you're telling the story in a way that's keeping your readers engaged, they will talk about it. And word of mouth is still the best form of advertising. Mm They're going to talk about it. They're going to tell others about it and other people will purchase your book. Wow. So you're saying that you have a lot of nonfiction writers who come to you and most Mm -hmm. of them want to write their memoirs, but the style and the approach is to kind of create a page turner which is the best of both worlds in terms of the reading. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. okay. Yeah. So wow. it's still their story. You know, nothing is made up. It's just mm-hmm. the way we wrote it. If those, you know, if they're telling what someone else said versus them telling us what they said is mm-hmm. in dialogue. So, you know, the reader will read it as this person is saying it. Mm-hmm. And you get the reaction of the person they're saying it too. So it's just like a novel, but it all really happens. Are most of your clients people who've never written before or they are, yes. oh, oh, okay. So these are first time <laughs> um, authors. Yes, they are. Oh, but All they come to you as nonfiction. Time. Okay. But yes, they come they to come you. They come to me with very little experience, very little experience. Okay. But they come to you as well as nonfiction readers. Yes. Okay. I got and it. And that's something I require. I give them you know, I tell them to go find some books. And I also have two of my clients who publish children's books. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing for them. Read books 
on whatever grade level you are writing to. I have them read books on that level so that they can see the language that's used, how the sentences are structured, how many words are on a page, you know, things like that, so that they can to guide them with writing and telling their story. So that's what I ask my uh my nonfiction writers to do as well. Read nonfiction books. You know, if your book is about divorce, then read other people's books about divorce. See how they put it together, especially those people who have a lot of reviews who've done really well with their books. Mm. So you're talking to us about the three novels that you wrote, and you say you wrote two novellas. What What are those about? How'd you come uh, to the idea that you would do the novellas? Um, well, actually, would you define that? Because some people may know what it is and some people may not. The difference between yeah. the novels and the novellas. The novella is a no- well, it's actually a novella. It is a shorter novel. There's not as many words. I believe it's maybe, I don't want to be wrong. I want to say like 8,000 words, eight to 10,000 words, something like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe more. It's pretty much half the length of a full length novel. I think that really became popular here lately because, you know, people are so busy and their attention spans are almost nothing. (laughs) So to Mm -hmm. sit down and read a full length novel to some people is like, oh, I can't even start this book because I'm not going to have time to get into it. So it's more intimidating than anything. So if you have a novella, which is like I said, half the length, most people will feel like, okay, I can finish this in a couple of sittings, you know, Mm -hmm. they may be more inclined to at least, gone and start reading it. The first one I did was the one I did through the anthology. Um, you really, the mind was, you really got a hold on me. Mm-hmm. So what we did after, after it was on sale for a few years, we decided to break it apart and everyone just sold their own story. Hmm. So that was my first novella. My second one was Torn, A Daughter's Love. And that one I published last summer. Um, last July came out and this one was about a young lady named Angel. Angel uh, was a health instructor. She's a health blogger. She's all things health. And the two people who needed her the most, she couldn't help, which were her parents. Mm -hmm. Both of them suffered from, her mom had diabetes, her dad had high blood pressure. And over the years of ignoring their health, they both of their kidneys started to deteriorate and they were on dialysis. Well, we know that you can only, you know, live a productive life for so long on dialysis. The best thing is a kidney to get a new kidney. So Angel, everyone was tested and Angel was the only match for both of her parents. So as time went on and both of them started getting worse, she knew one of them had to get her kidney. So it was a matter of who gets her kidney. Mm. Wow. So that's torn a daughter's love. You just left us hanging. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. That's what a good author (laughs) I love it. I knew you were going to do it. I'm just, I'm glued to the, my ear bees like, (laughs) okay, she's, no, she's not going to tell us. I already knew that, but that's cool. I like that. I like that concept. Wow. So. So much to you that, you know, I know this time doesn't permit all, but I do want to talk about how the web series, because I remember following that online and I kind of saw a little bit of it coming alive because I I follow you and didn't quite really know what was going on at first. And then I found out what was going on. Tell us Uh how you go from writing and books and novels and novellas and then you start this blog was it a blog that you were writing how did that happen to share a little bit about how you were doing that and all of a sudden somebody reached out to you about the script script, you know putting that out as a web series when I started the blog series it was actually through a conversation I was having with my cousin and She and I were talking about how people just really love series. So, I mean, if you think of Kimbla Lawson Roby, how she's Mm -hmm. done so well with the Curtis Black series over these last 20 plus years. And people are still wanting more Curtis Black. You know, of course, she's Mm -hmm. done with him now. But Mm -hmm. people just get so, and think about people with soap operas. Like they, it's almost like these people are family to them. They have to see them. 
So I was like, well, I'm going to try a blog series, see how that worked for readers. It wasn't long, maybe a thousand, 700 to a thousand words each um, Tuesday I would release. And it was just a continuation from, so each, at the end of each one was a cliffhanger. So you have to wait till next Tuesday to see what happens. So my friend, like I said, works in the industry. So she was at the time, I believe, working on Queen Sugar or something like that. And so she, after they wrapped up filming, she called me and she asked me, well, have you thought about doing a web series with your blog series? Which I hadn't thought about at all. You know, I was okay doing the blog series. So, of course, when she presented it to me, I was like, oh, that'll be cool. And it was a short, you know, it was short. So I, it wasn't like we were doing this full two-hour movie. Mm-hmm. It was going to be at the most 30 minutes. So then we started, well, she started telling me, you know, what all we need to do. We need to find actors and a location and props and, you know, all of this stuff. So we started, we got to work immediately we got to work and um started with our web mm-hmm. we only filmed one episode so far so like i said we will start with the next ones but it was the difference in film and and honestly i've used a lot of what i learned through filming i use that now in my books because i never heard of this the three x structure And, you know, even though I knew it existed, I didn't know there was a name to it where Mm -hmm. there's your first act, you know, the introduction, your second act, which is the middle part of your story where everything is really, really heightened. And the third act when everything comes together. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, even though I knew that existed, I didn't know it had a name. Keep all of that in mind when Mm -hmm. I'm writing. And um, it's so and just to be able to what I've written come to life right mm-hmm. before me, that was the biggest reward, like bigger than the title of National Best Seller. Mm-hmm. Seeing my work coming from these actors was like, oh my, and they really got into it and mm-hmm. they loved it. That was the best reward ever for me. Wow. So far. Wow. Well, I can see that's, that's sort of like that next level up. Yes, yeah, exactly, wow. because it, they've been in my head, you know, yeah. these people have been only in my head, but only I could see them, only I could hear them, and I was more like the dick, the dot, well, the interpreter, mm. <laughs> trying to show my audience what I'm seeing, so for them to actually see it themselves and hear it themselves, that was amazing, so wow. I can't wait till we start back. What an accomplishment. I also heard you were saying, because when I first met you, you were teaching. So you are you just straight doing your writing and producing type of work now? Yes. Yes, wow. I am. I am writing full time. Um, like I said, coaching. I have my clients mm-hmm. who I am helping to write their books mm-hmm. and producing. I'm still doing, writing more scripts and things like that. And mm-hmm. for that, I have to give credit to my husband. <laughs> Mm-hmm. because there is no way I would have been able to do this without his support mm-hmm. and encouragement to just step out and do it. You know? mm-hmm. Wow, that is important to have that uh, support, that structure in place for something that takes yeah. so much of your creativity. Your mind has to be in a place of being able to really create. And if you're stressed and of course. stuff like that, even though that comes with the work, it does help to have mm-hmm. Well, thank you, husband, for uh, making sure that <laughs> right. we thank you. Yes. Certainly, yes. Yeah, we that, do. you really need that because, you know, this is a journey that you no doubt have committed yourself to. And I appreciate you being that person, you know, to, to kind of help thank us. You. So I know it's so much, but I, I want to make sure. Can you tell us how, like, you're a teacher, you are an author, you just know everything. How can people (laughs) who want to just connect with you to just take a look at what you're doing, like your websites or handles on uh, social media to connect? Tell us how we can do that. So my website is author, L.A. Lewis, A-U-T-H-O-R, L.A. Lewis.com. Um, on Facebook, it's the same, Arthur L.A. Lewis. 
on Instagram is Lorna underscore loves underscore writing. Mm-hmm. A lot of my Instagram, for a lot of Instagram, I'm doing more coaching tips and things like that. So mm-hmm. it's different than Facebook. Mm-hmm. So Facebook is still Arthur L.A. Lewis. Instagram is Lorna underscore loves underscore writing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now I joined a writing like I said, I know you have a lot of people that are follow you, but I'm in one of your groups where you are doing some coaching. And uh, there was a challenge that you had a few weeks ago. Is that the same one that everybody would join or is it a different one? Facebook. Oh, on Facebook. Yes. L.A. Lewis Writing Warriors. Yeah, that's the one that I joined. Yes. Yeah. OK, because I remember putting out there. I need help. <laughs> with the project that I was trying to work with. But yeah, so that's one that people can join as well. Yes, definitely. Oh, okay. Okay, definitely. Great. okay. And that's okay. the one where I do actually most of my coaching. Mm-hmm. And because I feel like, you know, if you join a group, then you see it's about writing. Mm-hmm. So that's why I dedicate most of my time to that group. Of course, here lately, I hadn't been in there because I have not look the part mm-hmm. <laughs> to go on anyone's video. <laughs> yeah, we're all sort of in the mode of, at the time of this going live, you know, we would hopefully and preferably be out of what we're in, but we do have to acknowledge that we're in the COVID-19 sheltering in place. So, oh yeah, yeah, I just want to put that out there just in case we're, by the time this goes live, but we're on radio, so everything is in real time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I know we're on podcasting, but, you know, people can appreciate the authenticity that you bring to this. You know, it's not scripted. So we are, right. <laughs> yeah. Interviewing you before and interviewing you now, it's just like time has not passed, but you have. You have, pro- your, you know, your <laughs> your whole level has just gone up and I just, I'm so happy. Thank and you. I, wish, I know so much more is going to happen. So, if you want to connect with LA, you better go ahead and do it now. <laughs> do it now. <laughs> I, you Thank know, you. Yeah, that's true. It's true. So I'm excited. So as we get ready to close out, I just want to see if you had any parting words for the listeners who want to become authors and anything that they need to do that will keep them from being unstuck. Really, like I tell everybody, we all have a story. We all have a testimony. We've all gone through so much. For me, writing is therapeutic. So whether you're writing for yourself, whether you're writing to publish, the main thing is getting it out, Mm -hmm. especially in the beginning. That's why I said I was blessed when I wrote Dirty Little Secrets because I wrote it with no pressure. And it's even though I try not to put that pressure on myself now, sometimes I find that I do. But for those people who are just starting out, For those people who have the desire to write, just write, just write. Don't worry about how it sounds. Don't worry about the punctuation marks. The main thing is getting it out. We can always fix it once it's out. It has to be out first. We definitely can't fix it once it's still stuck in your head. So Mm. getting it out is the key. Wow. Well, we certainly trust what you just said. So that's coming from a real expert. So I am so appreciative. I can't thank you enough, LA. And I'm looking forward to my own journey with you in a not too distant future. So thank you again. I can't um, wait. Uh, me either. Oh, I'm so I'm even more <laughs> excited now. Like, oh, okay, yeah. So I am looking forward to that. And um, hopefully, maybe one day you can come back again and talk to us a little bit more. Definitely. About one of the books that, yeah. Once we see what happens, <laughs> once we read what right. happens, who got the kidney? <laughs> <laughs> Well, good good luck on even the uh, web series and getting that back on the way. Thank um, you so much. Yeah, Ellie. So listen, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, talk with you soon. You too. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. I am so excited that we are connected. 
Please subscribe and join us on a weekly basis for more real strategies, real truths from real experts. Baby.